Welcome to Baseball Biz. I'm Mark Carpenter, your host, and with me today is Brandon No Way. Hey, Brandon, how you doing today, buddy? I'm doing really good, Mark. How about you? Well, I've been trying to avoid, once again, sleep deprivation. But man, these games going on late into the night with the champion series, <laughs> with the championship series for the American League and the National League, it's getting crazy. Yeah, I don't blame you. In the ninth inning of the Red Sox Astros, I was trying not to fall asleep. I just couldn't help it. it the midnight's late for me now. Yeah, and <laughs> we're going to talk about that ninth inning. And those of you all who didn't stay up or didn't DVR it, we'll give you the details on how that Fenway effect, okay? I won't say more just yet. I always think, you know, the Red Sox with the advantage of the monster in the Fenway effect. But that ninth inning, that made things very interesting so before we get into that and we also look at the braves and the dodgers and uh charles barkley was saying the other day hey they're going to sweep the braves are going to sweep the dodgers we'll talk about if charles was right or not in just a minute or two but first a little bit of a closer look at what's actually happening with the business of baseball and specifically brandon i'm talking about the yankees you know the yankee fans have been so disgruntled this year didn't really make it into postseason. Well, maybe just a little bit with a wild card. <laughs> I guess you could say they made it there. Dang gone. You know, and I, all year long, I thought, I would hate to be Aaron Boone. You have, oh my gosh, they had a streak of wins. Then they had a streak of losses. Oh, somebody's injured. Oh, they're doing well. Oh, okay. You know, you, you didn't know what was going to happen with that team. And the fans certainly had their opinions. Yeah, they went from fire this guy, fire everybody, you know tear down the whole organization to hey this is the best team ever we're going to win the world series and then it was back to fire everybody again <laughs> and it looked like it could have gone that way for a while because they started firing a bunch of coaches and then the the boom front kind of quieted down and they gave him the three-year contract a couple of days ago and yeah i can't help but i told you this earlier i believe i think it was earlier maybe it was yesterday but it kind of feels like how in football or college or pro when like head coaches will fire a bunch of their staff. And then, then that's kind of like, Oh, he's a dead man walking. Cause that's like <laughs> the last resort they do to try and save their job. You know, and you're talking about that. It's amazing because the one thing that we know is that managers don't, really don't affect who they're able to put out on the field. So that's a criticism. I think that was given quite often about different players, but guess what? Booney doesn't get to make all those decisions. Brian Cashman up there in the front office does and a few others. So, Booney, what's going to happen? Yesterday, I, I looked at my phone real quickly and I said, oh, my gosh, he, he's not going to be he's not going to be manager anymore? Boone resigned. No, it's not resigns. Boone resigns. He, re he signed up again for another three years with the Yankees. So Cashman must love him. And I think overall, Yankees fans do as well. Yeah, I mean. I don't think he's a horrible manager. We kind of talked about it last week. I think it was where we were kind of saying, you know, maybe with the Yankees, it's more philosophical because if you look at that roster, they should be winning. Cause I mean, just look at the talent that they have. I mean, maybe that's not true. I, that's the only thing we could land on. Cause every other thing we couldn't figure out why they kind of disproved that. Yeah. So, I mean, we'll find out maybe, maybe was it him? Maybe is it his philosophy? Maybe it was just the coaching staff. Who knows? It, well, obviously not enough people because otherwise there'd be changes that are going to be made. I, I don't know. We'll see what they do next year. Before we get, again, before we get in those championship games, a couple other nuggets I'd like to touch on, Brandon. One of them, the streaming of the Major League Baseball games. We'll talk a little bit about that. What's happening with other managers as well. The minor leagues, what some news I saw passing came out with something yesterday. What what's happening there? Is MLB trying to actually do something for these people? Yeah, MLB is actually trying to help their players. And I know you were very passionate about this this topic, especially last off season. And it seems like now they're trying to help minor leaguers with housing. I haven't seen every detail on it. I haven't had the, the time to be able to focus and do the full research on it. But it sounds like they are going to help them with housing. I don't know, like, if it's certain levels or how much, like, if they're going to contrib contribute financially or if they're going to have, like, a setup little thing, like, kind of like how dorms do in college. Yeah. Maybe something like that. I don't 
know fully. I don't even know if they've come out with that yet, but that's something that we'll definitely keep an eye on. I know, I know you will. Oh, I definitely will. You know, I've seen some of these photos from other ones on Twitter where they show a, a group of sleeping bags in a basement. And it's like, oh, gosh, you've got these young people who are paying nothing. Actually, what are you going to do to these people? What Are you going to give them any kind of incentive at all? Are you going to make sure that they don't have to work at Burger King between games? Uh, well, enough of that. Uh, but that's, that sounds like a good sign. Right? And I'll look at that with a skeptical eye, and we'll, we'll keep a close eye on that, like I said, as well. Uh, the other thing, the streaming of games through Major League Baseball is sometimes it takes some cataclysmic event for a change to happen. This doesn't really qualify as that, but it's, it's kind of earth-shaking in a way. What happened was Bally Sports, who controls, I don't know, maybe 19 of the markets or more with the you know, local regular season games. Bally Sports has been working, I think, with the group Sinclair, trying to go ahead and look at streaming the games, okay? Streaming the Major League Baseball games in the markets where they have a presence. That kind of shook up MLB. So, yeah, right now we're putting something together, too, and we may have an MLB streaming service. You know, that thing that uh, Sinclair's doing, no, it, it really doesn't make sense. You know, that's, that's the word from MLB. You know, Manfred said more. We'll, do an, we'll probably do a show just on that sometime soon. Yeah. The parts that I did see, it's not going to affect, you know, the regional broadcast or MLB TV or anything. This is going to be like its own thing. And it's yeah. going to be more for those people to have like the streaming services like YouTube TV, Hulu, who can't watch their local teams because they're blacked out most of the time. And that's something that's really important for baseball because the casual baseball fan they're they're up there in age a little bit more and the more demographic they want to attract is younger and younger people for the most part at least that i know have a streaming service and they can't really watch as much as those games so that's something i think is something baseball should consider and should do which sounds like they're going to here in a couple years in order to get more younger fans involved well they have to i mean i'm so happy that somebody actually got them into gaming with esports the game, I, I don't know, the show. Okay. Oh, the show, like like video games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, they were intelligent enough to get involved with that. You know, so that was kind of reaching to a younger audience. And it just kind of amazes me that it's taken them so long to think about streaming. Um, but we'll see, you know. They're, they're, they have to, they realize, like, what I was saying a moment ago about a cataclysmic event, I think it actually just takes some, some uh, serious competition or from a competition coming up with an idea that's a little scary to them and say, oh, maybe we have better jump on the bandwagon. So if they, I hope they do. And I hope it's something that's great for the fans in the game. We'll see. Okay, one more piece of business, again, before we get to the championships. And that's take a look at what's been happening to the managers. You know, Brandon, I was looking at doing a show earlier this week because, you know, Mike Schilt got canned by the Cardinals. I'll be coming out with his message on Monday about what happened. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. This bad imitation show. But <laughs> I was expecting, I guess, some revelation to come out about he, he was fired because of philosophical differences. That's what the front office said, quote, philosophical differences, unquote. And what does that mean? Okay, Mike, here you are. You, you set up basically a Zoom press conference at 10 o'clock on Monday, and you're going to tell us what it is. And basically it was, I love everybody and I love the organization and, you know, a lot of good people. And I, I'd just like to say goodbye to them. I was like, come on, man, please, 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 please. It was, um, I don't know. What am I say? It was ignorance on my part to think that she would have said anything else. This is a man who's in a marketplace where there's only 30 positions. You know, there's 30 teams have 30 managers. They're not clearing house across all 30 teams. So he's got to play nice, nice. At least that's from my perspective, if he's going to get into the job. Yeah, he has to play. He has to play nice, at least for a little while, or at least until he gets back on his feet. This is something that when it happened, nobody understood why it happened. And everybody's like, something's going to come out over time. We still know nothing really, and nothing's really come out. I've done some stuff looking at, fan-sided with the Cardinals and then the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. 
it, it sounds like it it was philosophical differences where he wanted more like the old school cardinal way but they the being the front office you know baseball ops those people wanted to go in the new direction where it was more analytics so it was kind of like the clash of the two ideas and philosophical differences which i mean that doesn't make sense that happens but the part that doesn't make sense and fan side had brought it up was he's been there since 04 he worked his way up from being a scout so he is basically in the cardinals way in in the good way not like in their way from from letting them progress he, he is so, he's in, gotcha go ahead yeah he's ingrained in the cardinal way and it's been a very successful way even now and i don't know why they just couldn't you know blend the two together but like fan side had said with the guy that's been around this long that was high on their list when they hired him a, a few years ago to say when the season ended that they want to bring everybody back to a few days later firing him because of philosophical differences yeah there there has to be something more to that i don't why can't you just sit down and talk it out like they suggested in that article why can't you just sit down and you know hash it out talk it out instead of just giving him a phone call which was mentioned too and then saying that he's not coming back because there, there has to be something more to this yeah well and i would think so too and i can't imagine what it is but what did happen, you know, who knows? He's not cha- not tainted. I mean, there's there are professional coaches out there who are tainted for a lot of different reasons. Uh, non, Non-MLB non coaches, it's just in the last week. If you're paying any attention to sports whatsoever, Urban Meyer, you'll know who I'm talking about. Oh. oh. <laughs> yeah, he's had his problems. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't know. Um, we'll see what comes. Let's see. What else did we want to say about Mr. Shilp? Oh, um, well, this isn't directly with Schilt, but there have been some candidates named for the Cardinals job. There's um, Jose Aquenda, I believe that's how you say it. If not, I apologize. He he was an infielder with the Cardinals, and now he's a coach on their staff. Jose Molina came out and said he would think that it would be cool to have a Puerto Rican manager his last year. And that kind of brings up Carlos Beltran, who they threw in there, but they said that's not really likely. But like the current favorite is Oliver Marmol, who is the team's bench coach at the moment. And it could be either Marmol or uh, Okunda or Quenda. I, I can't pronounce his name. I'm sorry. But it could be down to those two because with the backing of Molina, you kind of would want to make a uh, – they do bring up the point that you would want to make a like a player-friendly hire here. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's I think, going to be important on their part to make sure they've got somebody that – the player's going to like if you come in to work one day and you got a beloved boss and suddenly he's gone, all the employees kind of like, uh, uh, what's next now? I, I would think baseball players are more than just like myself when I was an employee at the grocery store, but it's, <laughs> it's a little different, you know? And as, as long as we're talking about uh, managers, you know, one man, one guy who comes to mind right now, who's very young and that's the third base coach, Ron Washington. That guy has been exciting to watch the last few days. This guy's like 69 years old. The way that MLB has been looking at some of the recent hires, I mean, if you look at, uh, what is it, Tony La Russa with the, what, the White Sox? You look at Dusty Baker just a couple of years ago. To me, it wouldn't be or out of range to think that Ron Washington could be a candidate for, for another position as well. Yeah, I, mean, I didn't know he was still in the league. I thought he retired a few years ago, and he's also <laughs> younger than I thought he was. He's 69, which is younger than Dusty Baker, who I can't remember his age. They threw it in, his, in our face all ALCS last year. I think it's like <laughs> 73, 74. Yeah. But he, he would be a good guy to bring in. You know, he brought the Rangers their most successful years last decade. That's already 10 years ago, believe it or not. He had the great success there, and I think he could have that Dusty Baker effect, you know, maybe with like a Mets or an, or in a, yeah, the Mets or the Padres. I've seen him part up with the Padres. I think he could have great success there because he seems like kind of like Dusty where he's a player friendly coach and he's, he kind of like adapts with the times, you know, he's aggressive, but he's like a smart aggressive in a way. Yeah, he is. I'm, I'm really excited to see him. I've been love watching him last few games with the Braves. And as far as age goes, 
Think about this. This poor soul's out there on third base. He's out there to feel anybody who's been out on baseball this long outside with the sun bearing down on him. <laughs> I'm not surprised he looks maybe a little just a couple of years older than 69. <laughs> so uh I'm I'm pulling for him. He's only a couple of years older than I am. So we'll see what happens with him. He has been exciting. Okay, okay, we're, we've gotten past the business of baseball. Let's dig into what's been happening with these games. You know, what, where do you want to start? Do you want to start with the American League or National League? Um, let's start with the National League. They, they, they were the first game yesterday. We can start with them. <laughs> Why were they the first game, right? I mean, were you thinking here and saying, okay, Braves around the central part of the country, oh, it's being held out at Dodger Stadium. Hmm. Maybe that, that'll be the later game. But it wasn't. I didn't get that because a five o'clock game over here is it's still more difficult for people to get to. But, you know, it's not as difficult because it's it's five o'clock. You don't have to take off a full day of work. Whereas a five o'clock game on the West Coast, which translates to two o'clock. It seems much more difficult. And we saw it because we saw all those empty seats, especially in the upper deck around the, the foul poles or empty seats. I just don't understand having a big series like this where it's an important market like LA and the Dodgers, one of your biggest brands, if not the biggest, I don't understand why having this matchup at five, I think it would make more sense to have the Red Sox and Astros be the five o'clock game. Cause you can have more people at both games or at least more evenly matched. Cause you know, the crowd in the beginning of the Red Sox might be a little bit thinner around five o'clock, but I think they're doing it right today where the Red Sox are at five and then the Dodgers are at eight. I just, I just don't really understand that move. Well, maybe they're bouncing back and forth just simply so that people across the country, you know, maybe have a chance to see their time, their team. If it's a little bit earlier, I, that's me just grasping for straws. What can I say? <laughs> maybe they are. Yeah. It is know, MLB. <laughs> but it, like I said, the other day I was saying that Charles Barkley, Charles Barkley said, yeah, you know, the Braves are going to sweep, and I thought, man, it'd be sweet. The Braves, they'd, what, they'd won uh, one, two, is that right? Yeah, one, two games. Yes. And so there they, where were they? Were in, they were at Dodger Stadium. And it was going to be an interesting game. Charlie Morton, one of my favorite pitchers of all time, was out there. Who's he facing? He's facing the Dodgers, Walker Bueller. And, and Charlie... Charlie didn't have his best outing, but it was a good outing. I, I thought, well, you you did well. You pitched five innings. You did give up two runs. You know, he, he had three hits on him, but I think the the most difficult part was he had six walks on him. You know, that that's a lot. That's a lot. So that and he had one home run against him. And he it was just tough to see him out there. But yeah, you say, okay, it's still early in the game. You're, you're gonna be okay. Yeah, like like you were saying, Morton didn't seem to have his best stuff. He had a decent at best outings. He threw 96 pitches in five. And of course, all those walks, that's going to rise it up. If he cut down on the walks, he probably could have gone to six. But, I mean, you can't really complain too much. He gave the team a chance to win, and he did exactly that. And Bueller, he just didn't have a, a good outing at all. They're, they're kind of like the teacher from Ferris Bueller's Day Off, where they're just like, Bueller. Bueller, because yeah. he, he he wasn't out there doing Walker Bueller stuff, and that that put him in the hole early. Yeah, there was definitely a call for him, and my understanding was that's probably the shortest time he's been out on the mound, only three point two innings. That's a very short period. I'm sure they wanted more than three and two thirds innings from him. Maybe they can go with they were trying the the opener with them. <laughs> that could be, but you know, I was talking a moment ago about. Charlie having six walks, Bueller had three, and then, oh my gosh, Brandon, what, seven hits, four runs. It, it's just unbelievable. I mean, let's kind of walk through some of that, how that game started. We'll, we'll go over the game here, and the Dodgers, they jumped out to the quick 2 nothing lead as Seager hit the, the two-run <laughs> homer in the beginning. That was really only Morton's real mistake outside of the walks, of course, but those were the only... That was the only one that really came back to bite him. And the Dodgers kind of went quiet for the next few innings. And up until the fourth, they were shutting out the Braves. And then Jock Peterson had an RBI single against his former team. Duvall had a single that brought in Peterson. 
And then Dansby Swanson hit a single that brought in Peterson as well. And that gave them a 3-2 lead. And then Rosario walked with the bases loaded to make it a 4-2 lead. And then in the fifth inning, Duvall singled again, bringing in another run to stretch the lead to 5-2. to two. And from there, it kind of felt like the, the Braves were in control. Like the Dodgers were just like giving it their all, but the balls just, they weren't falling. They couldn't get anything going. And you could see it on the fans' faces in the stands. They had their their heads buried in their hands. It it just seemed like they were lost out there, didn't it? And the fans gave up. They had to take a toll on the Dodgers. During the seventh inning, seventh inning stretch, a lot of those fans stretched themselves straight out of the stadium. I, I noticed during the game, they had footage of cars pouring out of the stadium. And it's like, okay, all right. This right. I'm sorry. This is a championship series game. There's two innings left. What you're down by three, yeah. I understand you, you may not get there, but why would you leave an exciting game to see that great talent even for two more innings? And I, I don't get it, yeah. I mean, the people that leave early, most of them are like the fair weather fans, the, the real hardcore fans, they'll stay there to the end. And I, I don't want to leave a game early because I know if I do leave, I'll miss something exciting. And those people that did leave did miss something exciting because that bottom of the eighth inning. That was really exciting because Bellinger, he hit a three-run homer to tie it, and that place just erupted after that. And then a couple batters later, Mookie Betts hit a double to give them the five to six lead, something that didn't seem possible maybe 20 minutes before that. And that place was just going nuts, and then Kenley Jansen came in and struck out the side one, two, three, and he made it look easy. And then here we go. It's a whole new series, and the Dodgers could tie it tonight. Yeah, with Jansen, I was it was interesting seeing last night. He was he was on fire. He closed out that you know that ninth inning with finesse. But it was interesting to see him you know, the game before Atlanta, and they threw threw him in the ninth inning with two outs, and Porso came up hit uh, came up through one pitch was hit and the game over. You know, so that's a heck of a thing to to lose. I mean, just come in and have one pitch and it's done. But last night. He was fantastic. Yeah, and it's it's funny listening to all the people panicking over the Dodgers. They're like, oh, wow, what's happened to the Dodgers? There's a saying, I've heard it mostly around hockey. It's not officially a series until a team wins on the road. And no team's won on the road yet. So if the Braves win tonight, then we got a series. But both teams are winning at home so far. That's pretty much what you expect, isn't it? Well, as you were saying, man, they're going to have to go back. They're going to have to go back and see what they can bring. It's going to be exciting because, will once again, the Dodgers have another win. If they wind up winning all three at Dodger Stadium, then you're still going to have just two to three, and you've got, uh, as far as the number of games, you get, you have to have four to win, go back to Atlanta, bam. How do you think that's going to play? Yeah, I, I really want to see the – the Braves win it just because we haven't seen the Braves make it in the world series in a, a very long time. I, I believe the last time was like in the, the late nineties, I believe last time they made it. And it, it, it just be someone new and, you know, they're kind of like our guilty pleasure team being so close. So that'd be really cool to see them make it, but I think it's going to be a longer series. I wouldn't be surprised if it goes seven, maybe six. I don't think it'll be over in five. I think, I think six, will probably be whenever it ends. That sounds most likely. <laughs> Moving on to the American League. Now, that was that was a whole other ball of wax because while I was saying, wouldn't it be neat if the Braves won three games? Now, we got the Boston Red Sox playing last night, and they've lost one, but they've won two. And last night I said, okay, if they can win tonight, that means they'll have three. And then, then on Wednesday night, both the Red Sox – could win again and that would win they would go ahead and win the championship and the braves could complete a four-game sweep against the dodgers and that would be it you know we would have champions with four games that wasn't going to happen so last night in boston with a fenway effect it wasn't quite the same as what you were talking about everybody winning at home was it no and the Red Sox seemed like they were in control for a lot of this game. They 
I missed the first three innings because, of course, the Dodgers and Braves <laughs> went long. <laughs> so I, I tuned in. It was two to one. Man, the Red Sox, they seemed like they were in control most of this game. They were a really good pitching battle. You know, the Astros, they seemed like they were going more with the opener type strategy from what I saw. And Pavetta, he got the start. And, I mean, he was he was outstanding. He only threw 65 pitches. But he went five and only gave up the one earned run with three strikeouts. And he looked really good. I don't know why they didn't let him go longer. I think maybe they're just saving him. I'm not completely sure. But then they hand over to the bullpen, and they did really good the next couple innings. As Taylor and Adovino, they split an inning. They did good. Garrett Whitlock went two. He he kind of sputtered a little bit. He gave up a tie-in run, but could have been better, but it also could have been a lot worse. And then that, that brought us to the, the Eovaldi situation. In the Was it the eighth or the ninth? By the time you get to the ninth inning, Nate Eovaldi is brought into the game. And what is, I think at that point, was it? Uh, I believe he came in at the start of the inning. Yeah, so Nate came in at the top of the ninth. And what happened with that? That 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 whole thing just evaporated. It, it went south really quick. And I'm not completely 100% sure the understanding of bringing him in out of the pen to close the game out late. I mean, I maybe Cora touched on it in his press conference. I didn't see it, but full disclosure, I didn't watch his press conference. I, I fell asleep because it was 12, 12.30 by the time this game <laughs> ended. But pretty much from when he came in, he, I believe Correa was the first guy he faced, and he got on base right away, and it just seemed to unravel. And then he got to two outs, and then it felt like, you know, maybe he can get out of this inning and then get to the bottom of the ninth tide. And he did for like a split second because we saw a pitch. It was a strike. Everybody knew it except the home plate umpire. He called it a ball. Yeah. And I tweeted it out. And two pitches later, who was it that hit the, uh, hit those RBIs? I can see he had Jason Castro. He brought in Correa and then Brian Brantley. He did a, hit a three run double and he brought in, uh, see Guriel and, uh, see Castro and now Tuve. So, wow. And it takes a game from it had been tied. And then Jason Castro bringing in Correa was three to two. And then Brantley came in. And with this three run double, suddenly it's six to two. Man, that happened quick. And I think it was Castro that got the uh, the first blow to make it three two. And then it went to Brantley. But man, things just unraveled in a hurry. I mean, it's like when you like unwrap a a roll of toilet paper and then you just take your hand and then you smack it and then just keeps, keeps rolling and rolling and it's falling all over the floor. <laughs> That's what I imagine that that was like. Cause I mean, it wasn't like a slow, a slow burn. It happened so quick. I wonder if Boston felt like somebody had taken that toilet paper and wrapped it over all the trees in front of the uh, Fenway. <laughs> I mean, I'm lucky I didn't get up to go to the bathroom when I, if I would have come back, it, it would have been nine to two. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a shame. I mean, Nate was at, at uh, Nate and Wilde, he was up to what to 17 pitches and all that started just going to poop. It's like the, the, the gif they say on Twitter of the guy that walks into his house with the box of pizza and everything's on fire. <laughs> that, that's what it felt like. Oh man. It was absolutely crazy. So that goes on. What? And then they bring in uh, Martin Perez, right? Uh, yes. You've got the ninth inning. You've got two outs. And he comes in, and for a third of an inning, he gets four hits. <laughs> he walks one guy. <laughs> and not surprisingly, there's two runs on him. And it's a conflicting feeling, going back to the fan side of us. It's a conflicting feeling because normally we would be loving this happening to the Red Sox. The only problem is the team that's benefiting from it is the Astros, who, I mean, full disclosure on the fan side, we're not very big fans of no no not, not and you know I've, I've seen some folks on twitter going on and on about well yeah that's fine let's go ahead the american league championship series where we match two cheaters i said what oh yeah we, alex cora and the astros well forget it okay people get over it i, I understand it there is maybe a little bit of sting if your team isn't in there but these are two great teams who would have ever even thought that the red sox would be here you know at the beginning of the year Hyam bloom was the uh GM at 
<laughs> Boston was he was getting torn a new one by his fans when he traded away Mookie Betts. Who did he trade him away for? Was it Verdugo? <laughs> well, I don't even know if those guys are still on the team. To be yeah, honest, or at least most of them. I mean, Verdugo has made a big, 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 big difference. Oh, but it, it's crazy. I can't pull for either one of these guys. I am interested to see how it plays out tonight for both the American League and the National League. Just a couple of fun notes. It was interesting to see what you got with the Braves and Dodgers. I believe you have a Will Smith on both. One's a pitcher, one's a catcher. <laughs> that is correct. And uh, it was interesting. So if you see Will Smith, the catcher, you know, up to bat, and he's facing Will Smith, the pitcher. I Let's see here. The Braves had a right-handed pitcher by the name of Luke Jackson. Jackson, okay? And then, of course, if you look at the Dodgers, one of their people is uh, A.J. Pollock. So at one point, Jackson was pitching to Pollock. And for all you art fans out there, yes, abstract artists, thinking, of course, of Jackson Pollock. But I, I do have to say I'm also enjoying some of our old Rays folks that we're seeing out there. We're seeing what? Uh, of course, Darno. And Charlie Morton playing together last night. Uh, Renfro played. Renfro, uh, there you go. Eovaldi. Io, he he made an appearance. Eovaldi. And let's see, Heredia is out there somewhere. Where's he, which team is he with? Oh, Heredia. I believe he's with the Braves still. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. You see all these guys that you know out there. And me personally, looking also at Adam Duvall from home, where I'm my old hometown in Louisville. <laughs> but like piggybacking <laughs> off of what you were saying, our old friend Steven Souza Jr. made an appearance. He pinch hit. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting. It goes back to what we said before. You know, even when I had Matt Germain on recently, he said, you see Eric Neander's fingertips everywhere, his fingerprints everywhere. And, man, you do. You can't be a Rays fan without continually being able to enjoy the game above and beyond the Rays because your your favorite players sooner or later are going to be out there, you know, traded to another team or, or let uh, – or maybe not re-signed. I want to also give a shout out. Before last night, I did not know who this guy was. I'd never heard of him. Full disclosure, I did not was not able to watch very many Dodgers games. But this is one of the great names, Phil Bickford. I, I first saw him, I was like, "Who is this guy?" Which I, honestly, we say over every, every opening day when we watch the Rays. <laughs> uh, who is this guy? And. I think that's a great name. If he played for the Rays, I would buy his his jersey. Yeah, it's it is interesting. Somebody said, "Well, we've, we've never heard of him." I was like, "Yeah, you know," and, and they're bringing him here into the championship series. I thought, "Well, that sounds like a Raysway kind of thing." If you, oh, Shane Boz, you haven't seen him? Okay, McClanahan, maybe not. Maybe you have. <laughs> so, uh, before I get too deep into to our world with the Rays and other ones we love, I I got to say this is an exciting series. You know, we got a lot more that we're going to talk about on Baseball Biz as this progresses. We probably won't be doing a show tomorrow. We'll probably wait until the championship series have been won and talk about what's going to happen with the World Series. Brandon, is there any other critical things you think we need to address today? Um, no, I believe we covered all of our bases yet again this week. But boom boom. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to you know, think we're both going to be keeping an eye on what's going to be happening with the minor leagues and the uh, Sinclair thing. We'll give you a report to you next week on what's happening with managers. And as always, there's always going to be something bubbling up to the top of the baseball world. We'll have that for you as well. Okay, everybody, I want to thank you once again for joining us here at Baseball Biz. I'm Mark Carbett, your host, and you can find me at The Baseball Biz on Twitter. You can find Brandon at Sports Blitz Pod on Twitter. If you're listening to Brandon, you, you could probably see some tweets about other sports from Tampa too, including <laughs> the Lightning and the Bucks. So I want to thank you again for listening to Baseball Biz. And you can find us on podcast directories everywhere. Google, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, all this and more. So thanks again, folks. And we'll talk with you again real soon. Special thanks to XTech RUX for the music rocking forward. <laughs>